Up next, a preview of Gorinto from Grand Gamers Guild. Gorinto was designed by Richard Yanner and features art from Josh Capel. It's going to launch on Kickstarter by Grand Gamers Guild on February 12th. That is one week from today for those of you here live. Tomorrow, for those of you catching us on the podcast, and I don't know, Wednesday, for those of you who catch us when we go out on YouTube on uh, this segment, to be on Friday, so Saturday, Sunday, what is that, four days from now for them? Something like that. Anyway, um, from what I know, the plan is to have it in people's hands this year, assuming it funds, but don't quote me on that. Uh, besides the fact that may not be the actual date they're aiming for, you know the Kickstarters get delayed. So we've played a prototype version so far which means we've got the rules near or at their final form, but we didn't play with pieces that will be coming out with the Kickstarter. And that's an important fact, is some of the biggest problems I would have had with the game were physical and therefore won't actually impact the game. Yeah, very true. So Mark Spector from Gan Gamers Guild did assure me the rules are pretty much finalized. Now, there are some feedback we provided that you may throw in, but like the basic mechanics are not going to change in this game. The basic rules, how the game is played, he may toss in some variants. Now, he did want to stress that the game will be significantly physically better than the copy I played. Now, that's not going to matter for most of you watching on the podcast or even in the video because I don't have the copy of the game here. But if anyone checks out my blog post, you'll see pictures of the components. Those are not the final components. Uh, the mountain, which we'll explain what that is later, is going to be spread out so you can actually reach the tiles. It's about, uh, what do you say, a third smaller than it should have been. The tiles themselves are going to stack. Uh, based on the prototype pictures he sent me, it looks like upwards, if anyone's played that. Uh, and there will be other improvements. The thing to note is that all the pictures on the blog, any pictures I share on social media, uh, Sean may put up a picture up between our faces for the cover of the box. All of that may change by the time the game actually comes out. What we're talking about is a prototype. Also, due to the fact there's a prototype, I like to start off every one of these reviews telling you to go watch my unboxing video. Well, I don't have one of those. And I'm not even going to talk about the components because they're going to be different when the actual game comes out. I will say this was very playable, though. Like, I've gotten some prototypes from companies before that look like prototypes. This, I, I bought completed, finished games that had less polish than this prototype. Yeah, absolutely. I, while I would have had comments and complaints based on the existing components, if you had told me it was the final game, I wouldn't have doubted you. Yeah. No, <laughs> it, it was close enough. You'd be like, what are these extra bits for? That's about it. But they, they were definitely serviceable. Now, for those of you who don't know what a Gorinto is, a Gorinto is a style of Japanese pagoda made up of a stack of five different stone shapes. These shapes represent the five elements of earth, air, fire, water, and void. Now, I didn't know this myself. I had to Google it, so don't feel bad if you're in the same boat. Um, this is also what's on the cover of the box. So if anyone's seen the cover of the box, like, what, what's this abstract thing? That's a Gorinto. Um, that's a... In, the playing piece that marks the seasons is also a Grinto, so the name's in there. Doesn't really matter that much for what you're doing in the game, but there is some tie-ins, actually. Surprisingly high number of tie-ins, actually, from what I consider an abstract game. In Grinto, players increase their understanding of the elements by collecting tiles representing each of those five elements. Tiles are collected by moving a tile from the path, which is the edge of the board, onto the mountain, the main board, which is a 5x5 five five grid of tiles. What the tile, tile, which tile you put on the mountain determines which tiles you can then collect. Collected tiles go into stacks by element on your own personal player board, so you're, you're tableau building in a way. Now, the game's played over four seasons. At the end of each season, players score points based on randomly determined goals set at the beginning of the game. The scoring is based on the player's knowledge of the elements, which is what that personal player board represents. You're having four... Uh, fire tiles means you have four knowledge in fire. And that's what ties into the scoring cards. Now, at the end of the game, there's also two bonus scoring cards that score, and those are based on two of the five elements. So every game, two elements are worth a bit more. So the rules are incredibly simple. And teaching is made easy by the fact that you just have to describe how you take a piece and when, and mm -hmm. then scoring, because it's always random, becomes part of the game, not part of the teach. Yeah, it's true. You don't have to preload the how scoring is going to work. That's a good point. So the way you actually play is on a player's turn, you take one of the tiles from the path, which is adjacent to what they call the mountain, the big grid of tiles in the middle, and you put it in the same row or column you took it from. So you, you have to follow the grid. Now, the element of the tile that's placed determines which tiles you are eligible to remove, and each of the elements different. 
and they're short enough. I'm going to go through all of them. Fire is really simple. You can take tiles from the same column in the mountain. Water is the opposite, where you can take tiles from the same row. Wind lets you take from orthogonally adjacent, whereas void is the opposite, letting you take diagonally adjacent. The weirdest one, though, is earth. That actually lets you take tiles from the stack you just put the earth tile on. And it's explained right there on the board. You don't actually have to remember anything. It's all right there. You can just stare at the board and all the information you need for your turn is there, but other than what you might want to actually want to choose is right yes. there in front of you. Yeah, no, no strategy tips on the board, but it, it clearly shows what each tile type does. Um, important to note for people like Red Meeple Ryan in our chat room, the tiles are both color coded and have symbols on them. So there is a way to tell the board. What I don't think is going to happen is I don't think they'll be tactically different because you have to pull them from a bag. And that's a compromise you're kind of stuck with. So you will be able to tell the tiles apart either by reading the symbol or by the colors. Now, this is kind of neat, too. So once you put your tile out, the number of tiles you get is based on your knowledge of that element thematically. And what that's represented by is how many of that tile type you already own plus one. If tiles can be taken, they must be taken, which gets really important by the end game. So on your first turn, you're going to play one tile. You don't have any tiles you own, so you're only going to get to draw one tile, right? Makes sense. But in later turns, you're going to take more tiles because your personal style supply of tiles representing your knowledge is going to grow. So for example, say you have three fire tiles on your player board. When you play a fire tile from the path onto the mountain, you're going to get to take four tiles from that column. So... This is actually a wonderful and frustrating <laughs> aspect of the game. You can easily end up taking more than you want. I didn't see a game or wasn't involved in a game where there wasn't someone who, at some point during the game, wished they could take less tile than they had to at that point. Yeah, just and the, the reason for that is the scoring tiles, because you just keep conti continue drafting tiles around the board until the end of the season, which happens once there's not enough tiles on the path for someone to go. Then everyone scores both goal cards that are in play. Now, the first player then passes the player in last place, and you move to the next season. That's a neat catch-up mechanic. Uh, a little bit more about that later, though. At the end of the game, you're also going to score those two bonus cards, which are going to give you points for collecting two of the five elements. Now, in addition to the base game, the prototype copy I was sent also had five dragon tiles. As far as I know, these are in the Kickstarter. They may be a stretch goal. Again, Kickstarter's not live yet. I couldn't tell you. What these are for is you can mix them in with the rest of the tiles and they work as a wild card. When you put a dragon from the path, you choose what element it acts as. So determining what you're going to draft. But when drafting it from the mountain, it's different. It's still a wild card, but you get to decide where in your personal supply it goes. Uh, there's also a bunch of different ways to set up the mountain, which I actually thought was really neat. Actually a lot of fun and surprisingly changes the way the game plays, where the, the, the heights of the different stacks actually did change it. Finally, now this was not included in my copy of the game, but Mark sent me the rules for a team-based mode, which will be an official variant for four players. And this is really neat. In this mode, your scoring cards are placed between each pair of players. And you only score the ones on your left and right, so think between the two cities. Players are partnered with the person sitting opposite, who has no access to those scoring cards and has their own. After you take tiles, you must give one tile to your partner each turn. That is a fascinating way to play. Absolutely. So, overall, while you're not getting a huge volume of components in this game, I mean, this is not a Cthulhu Death May Die or, you know, no. some Simon game. This is a tiny little, you know, fun game. The replayability is massive due to the wide variations in starting forms and scoring. And I should have counted them. There were a number of those scoring cards. I couldn't tell you exactly how many. It was a stack. It yeah. was not a small stack. All right, straight up, I'm going to say it. I love what I've seen in Gorinzo so far. This is an excellent and fascinating abstract game. Yeah, and I can only second that. It's one of those games we've talked about where something very simple ends up generating powerful and complex outcomes due to the very simplicity, its very simplicity, simplistic nature. Yeah, the, the, the easy to learn, difficult to master. We've said 100 turns about 100 different games. Now, I will say, of all the times I've played the game and have facilitated being played by others, because I've done that, I've just taught it and let others play, I have heard a couple minor complaints, and I think it's worth bringing them up. These all resolve around four-player plays. I've never heard a complaint at any other player count. The first was that the player in last place can be limited in their options, and it's slightly frustrating, but if the same person goes twice in a row in first, putting that same person in last twice, it can be particularly punishing. 
The other issue that was brought up is that with four players, you only get two turns per season, whereas all the other player counts, you get three turns, so it feels a little more limiting. Now, that second complaint, I personally didn't see as a problem because it speeds up the four-player game, so it still keeps it in that short time frame. To me, it's just something you need to realize. I think you only really notice it if you play a three-player game and then a four. You're like, oh, wait, I thought I was going to get to craft more. But I did find overall the game flowed better with two and three players. Just with four, it just took a little long. But now with that four-player team mode, throw that out the window. If you're going to play four players, play with that team mode. I really enjoyed that version of play. Yes, you only get the two drafts, but really you're getting four because your partner is also helping you out. And yeah, gameplay was longer, but the I don't even know how to talk with about it. The interplay between you, what do you need one of these? Do you want one of those? No, no, don't give me that. Well, I got to give you something. Like that whole thing was fascinating. Now, as for the last player problem, I have not seen that in a game I played. I don't know if it was just a fluke or not, but I did mention it to Mark, uh, who has been awesome about communicating with me during this whole thing. And he suggested if players find this a problem, it's really simple. They almost put this in the base rules to so just rotate the start player each turn. Because people are going to feel that's more fair in a way because that means someone goes first in all the seasons anyway. And it may just be a perception issue, maybe not. But that is a perfectly valid variant that do it either way. Like, do do the catch-up mechanic where the, the player in last goes first or just rotate it if you feel there is it's too punishing for the player in fourth. Yeah. So I played in three and four player configurations only. And while I wasn't bothered by the turn count issue yeah. in four player, I did experience and see another person's experience... Uh, Sean Hamilton, not Sean. Yep. So Sean Hamilton and Sean from Hamilton both experienced this final player problem. Now, I don't think it's something that breaks the game, but it does seem to be something that you need to plan into your strategy, yeah. uh, you know, more so than in many games. And in most games these days, going last really doesn't matter that much. Uh, going oh, first does. usually gives an advantage, whereas in this game, I felt giving going last changes things enough that you need to really think about it and plan for that. Um, so whether that's a feature or a flaw, again, that's... It may, yeah, it may just be something you need to be aware of. Personally, I didn't... What I found is it was frustrating because often what you wanted to do, you couldn't do. Someone will have taken your tile. But I never felt I didn't have an option. So it was there was the frustration level of, oh, I wanted that, and you stole it. And then next turn, you did it again. But I still had options. Like, there were still other tiles. There were still very valid placements. So I didn't find it as bad. But I'm also wondering, maybe this is just a Sean problem. So we'll have to introduce the game to another Sean. And if that Sean has it, it just could be a Sean problem. <laughs> I don't think that's actually true. Overall, I had a ton of fun playing around with this prototype of Grinto. Uh, I look forward to the Kickstarter campaign myself. I would like to wish Mark and the Grand Gamer Guild luck, but I really don't think they're going to need it. I, they have a very solid game here. I have no doubt this will fund unless there's something completely wacky. Excuse me. Plus, there's something completely wacky on their Kickstarter. But this isn't their first rodeo. This company put out Endeavor, Age of Sale, a very successful, already delivered, fantastic Kickstarter. So I don't see a problem with the game. I don't see a problem with the company. I personally know a handful of gamers who have already decided they're backing this game, including our Gloomhaven partners, Tori and Kat, who are like, we're buying this. Like They, they played twice. That's it. It took them two games, one, one four-player game and one four-player team game. They're like, no, we need this. Yeah, I'm on the fence as to if I'll back the campaign or not. But... Not because of the quality of the game, it's just a matter of is it going to be worth it for the number of times I'm likely to get it on the table yeah. compared to something like the Duke. Uh, yeah, if you were, if you got out some local game game events more often, yeah, I'd absolutely. say pick it up. But for playing with your son, you're probably going to have more fun with the Duke. Yeah, exactly. This is the little bit more theme there is probably going to tie it in. Yep. All right, well, for a more in-depth look at Garinto, check Mo's written review over at tabletopbellhop.com. Just click on Reviews.